All right. Well, we have a number of people already logged on. So um, I just, uh, we will get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Joan Spurl. I'm director of Dolly Parton's Imagination Library at the Literacy Cooperative. We're the affiliate of the program for Cuyahoga County. Um, I'm assuming many of you are um, Imagination Library families. Um, if you're not, that's fine. We want, this is open to anyone um, interested in learning more about this topic. And um, later in the program, we will be sharing a link to a survey. We would love for you to um, complete uh, if you, uh, with your feedback and input, we wanna know how these programs are helpful and what other topics you would like covered. The reason we're doing this topic, well, of course it would be one that makes a lot of sense for us to, to do, but um, it was one that one of the families in a survey requested and it made so much sense and that we certainly had a lot of interest in it. Um, so I am very pleased um, that we can present this today. We will be doing more programs um, as the year proceeds. Um, please make sure you tell families that you know about Dolly Parton's Imagination Library if they have children under the age of five. It's available to every child under five in Ohio and we know it's really important for language development to be reading aloud to your children in um, the earliest years, especially from, well, in birth to three are critical. But you're gonna learn a lot more today from an expert from the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center. Dr. Rebecca Mental is the director of the Speech, Language and Learning Services at Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center. She's one of the coordinators of Project Ella, which is Early Language and Literacy for All, which you see at the top of the slide, a public health program for children from birth to age five. And one of her passions is educating the community about speech and language development. So this is a perfect venue <laughs> for you. And um, so I am looking forward to learning. Uh, I like to be a lifelong learner. And um, again, you will be able to put questions in the Q&A and I will manage that after the presentation. So I'm gonna go off screen and mute myself and let you go, let you begin. Thank you so much. All right, hi. Um, thank you everyone who is attending today. Um, as Joan said, we definitely have some weather going on. So I'm hoping they will have no glitches here, but um, I don't think it's as bad as they were saying it was going to be. So maybe we'll be um, we'll be okay. So the title of my talk is um, is born to talk speech and language development in children aged birth to five, and this is a a really really important um, age for language growth and everything. So I'll just kind of be telling you more about the path to language development and how to build language, what to look for, and when to, um, you know, follow up on concerns that you might have. Make sure this will turn. Okay, so I'll just do an introduction. I'll talk about who I am and who Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center is. We'll talk about language building um, from birth to age five, speech and language developmental milestones, speech and language building tips. We'll talk about shared book reading, um, flags for referral to a speech language pathologist, and then we'll do questions. Um, it does seem like a lot, but there's a lot going on in, um, in this birth to, to age five language development time. So, um, like um, Joan said, I'm a speech language pathologist by clinical training. Um, right now, I mostly do administrative work running the department of my team. I do still see a few little ones, which I do like, um, a couple two-year-olds. And um, I've been the director of speech language and learning services for Three, about three and a half years now at Cleveland Hagen Speech Center, but I have been involved with Cleveland Hagen Speech Center since I was in graduate school. It's a really great organization. It's an amazing nonprofit. And I kind of did my first grad school placement there for speech pathology and never left. Um, I have my PhD in communication sciences from Case Western Reserve University. And then I have my master's of public health from Baldwin Wallace University. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about Project Ella today, which is um, speech language pathology is starting to see language building needs to take more of a public health approach to really help grow those skills in the community. So um, it's public health is a big interest area of mine as, and as far as how that relates to language. 
So Cleveland Hanging Speech Center is actually the nation's oldest speech and hearing center. We are this year, I believe, 102 years old. So we've been around a long time. We have speech therapy, we have audiology services, we have interpreting for both American Sign Language and spoken languages, and we have um, social services for deaf and hard of hearing individuals. So we are located in University Circle, Lyndhurst, Westlake, and Broadview Heights. And uh, Project Ella, which is Early Language and Literacy for All, is a program that we have where part of it is um, outreach into the community. So getting outside of our four walls, going into the community, educating people about language building. And it's also um, at our University Circle location, hopefully with grant funding expanding to all our locations, it's free services for children birth to age five. So that's free evaluation, free treatment, all the way up until um, through five years of age. So until that sixth birthday, just because we don't want any barriers to, to be, um, you know, either really in place or perceived. We want anyone who, you know, wants an evaluation or wants to come for treatment to be able to do that. So right now, that's just at University Circle, the free services. But like I said, we've got, we've got grants out to, to get it to the others. So with Project Ella, which focuses on birth to age five, um, kind of like, well, you know, why did we pick that age group? And um, really birth to age five is, if you think of language building, um, like building a house, that is when the foundation is really being built. Those very early years, starting in birth, starting even before birth, that language foundation is being built. And really a child's exposure to and practice during that time period is what makes that foundation weak or strong. And foundation we know, you know, is underneath, it supports everything else. So this is how, how a child starts out in life is so important to um, the skills that they will gain later. And we want that foundation to be as strong as possible. I always want to say, if things don't start out in the best way, or a child isn't exposed to as much language as maybe they could have been, this doesn't mean that the house can't be built or the house is just going to fall down. It just means that it's easier if to build this house when we start earlier, but there's never a point where, you know, the house can't be built. So I do want to stress the importance of early, but I also want to stress that it's never too late to start language building. So let me see if I can get this video to play. I really hope I can. It's very short. It's just like a minute and a half. And this is um, from Harvard Center on the Developing Child. And it does a fantastic job of explaining how um, really neurodevelopment works, how that brain develops based on experiences that children have. So let me try to play this. Let's cross our fingers that it works. Um, and Joan, just shout out to me if it's not working, um, but I will try it. Let's try. A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. 
While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. So I do, I just think that's, um, I think it's really important to have a visual like that when you're thinking about how the brain develops and what's happening when children are having these experiences. And you can really see that that's how those connections are made. And you also heard that things that aren't used as much end up kind of fading away. So what a child is exposed to over and over is going to build those strong connections um, in their brain. And the reason why um, this is such an important time too for brain development is something called developmental neuroplasticity. And what that means is how, how easily the brain is able to change in response to experiences. So you can see um, on the bottom there is the age. So we're looking at like two years old and it just, it goes up to 70. And then on the other side, on the left side, um, is kind of how the higher the line is, the easier changes to make. And um, the lower the orange is, the um, lower the amount of effort it takes to make the change. So you can see that when a child's that age, when they're, you know, birth to five, that line for the ability to change is so, so high. Like their brain is ready. Their brain is forming. Their brain is changing all the time based on what they experience and learn. And then the amount of effort that that takes is very low. It just kind of, it's just happening. It's just happening naturally because that's where the brain's, the brain's at. The brain's ready to grow and learn. And then um, you can see as you get older, it's the brain never stops having the ability to change. It never stops being plastic. And um, we've seen this with older individuals who have strokes, who lose language skills. We are able to help build those back to, you know, differing levels because of neuroplasticity. But it's so much harder with an adult because the way that the brain is when you age it can change, but it isn't as simple to change as it was before. So this is why it's such a key time to, to really intervene and um, give strong experiences in those first few years of life when the brain is just, just ready and taking it all in and building and changing. So I'm gonna tell you about a really, really powerful tool for language building and what we call it at Cleveland Hanging Speech Center is catch and pass. So this is the idea of going back and forth with a child in communication. So this is for all ages. This is from birth, when the baby coos a little bit, you coo back, you make a response back. The one-year-old is kind of looking at something and wondering, and you use your attention to look over and wonder as well. So you're catching them in this communication attempt, and then you're passing back your own communication attempts to them. So this does seem really simple, but it's often for those little kids, not intuitive for parents, you know, even when it's babies before they're saying their first words, this can start from their earliest, earliest, you know, days of life, just going back and forth with facial expressions, with anything, it's that back and forth. And what's interesting about this is, this is really what the latest research is showing us that this back and forth is the most, one of the most important things for language building. Um, we're, we used to think, it was just maybe the amount of words that you hear. I know there's been, you know, a lot of um, kind of media about the 30 million word gap and things like that, which is a very complicated topic that I would say the gap is probably less, but I don't want to get into to that research with you now. But it isn't just the words they hear. We found out with this really neat research they can do now with wearable technology. So this is little vests that kids wear that have a recording device in them. And the recording device can tell how many words are spoken to the child by an adult and can tell how many times the child and adult went back and forth. And this is through, it does it through acoustic analysis. Um, so it analyzes the sound. And so nobody has to go through and like listen and count. So this has been a really powerful tool for us. 
And what they found through behavioral research, meaning like testing these kids with standardized testing, what they found through um, neural structural imaging, so taking images of the brain and looking at white matter, and what they found through neural functional imaging, so taking scans of the brain and looking at how the brain is reacting to certain stimuli. In every single study like that, they have found that it's the back and forth that is the strongest predictor of child language skills. And this is independent of socioeconomic status because we know that kids from lower socioeconomic status background often um, struggle more with language skills for a variety of reasons. But they've had kids in these studies who come from that background who maybe have weaker connectivity and doing an intervention where this catch and pass, this back and forth is encouraged, we see changes in the brain that, that things are changing. So this is an incredibly powerful tool that really just recently we realized like, oh my gosh, like this, this is what it is. It's not just hearing words, it's this absolute back and forth. It's not just having only directive interactions with the kid, you know, like do this, do that. It's really that back and forth interactive communication. And it's it's just the simplest thing that is so, so powerful. So I just think it's a really exciting thing that we've learned. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about um, language development as a child ages. So an interesting thing is that language development really begins before birth. Um, they've been able to show that fetus is at 38 weeks of gestational age can recognize their mother's voice based on their heart rate response is how they studied that. And then they found that full-term infants as young as seven hours old can distinguish their native language versus a foreign language um, based on that passive input they received in the womb. So later on in that pregnancy towards the end when hearing is, is more developed, the babies are, are listening and learning. So it's, it's right from the very beginning. So I'm going to talk um, about infant speech and language growth first. So even though these are, you know, the little, little ones, there's, there's a lot going on with, um, with these kids one year and under with what they're doing. And um, these, these, from the very beginning, from the first month old, you can do that catch and pass, you can go back and forth with them. So at one month, you're really just looking at kind of, you know, crying at the loud noises and then quieting when listening to gentle speech. So um, they will respond to that. And actually, oh, okay, I see in the Q&A, back and forth communication. So with this, let's say this picture right here with um, that little baby, if the baby is, because it doesn't even have to be words, if the baby is like, is smiling and the mom smiles back, that's back and forth. If the baby then waves her hands and mom waves her hands and even like makes sounds like, ooh, that's back and forth. So it's getting that input and then giving something back. When you get older with the older kids, if you know the kid is like, hey, look, there's a bird. And you're like, oh yeah, I see the blue bird. And then you just kind of go back and forth that way. Or um, if you're reading a book, and um, you say, hey, you know, like, what's this dog doing? And then the kid, then the child says what the dog is doing. And then you go back with some kind of response. So it's really very broad in what it can be. It's anything that's, that's back and forth, that's passing back and forth, that communication. And I will say that in this presentation, I'm focused on um, kind of children who are developing neurotypically. So it can be a little bit different with autistic kids, but this back and forth is kind of that, um, that important part. And it can be, with, with autism, it can be a little bit different if the child doesn't go back and forth as much, but um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen with them. Like it's very important with them. It's, um, it's just sometimes it's a little bit, little bit different. Um, then at, two months um you have let me try to close this chat now hold on there we go um just kind of crying smiling gurgling grunting three months you start to get the cooing and they start to really respond to familiar voices um and as you go on you just kind of get that increased cooing that increased squealing that increased gurgling noises starting to repeat starting to listen more to voices and sounds 
starting to make sounds to express emotions. So even over these months, you know, I mean, we know that infants change very, very quickly, that over these months, it's really just kind of the sounds they're making are increasing and the ways they seem to be reacting to those com to communicating with them is also getting more sophisticated as well. Never wants to go. So at seven months, you're looking at, you know, the baby imitating you, saying things like mama or mama, they're babbling more. They start responding to their name at eight months um, and just increase communication overall. Nine months, they're understanding other people's names. They, um, they seem to understand kind of simple words. They start to imitate more and more. They can do things like saying up while they raise their arms. And then looking at 10 months, that when they're really starting to kind of harness that communication and say, okay, I can use this communication, you know, to, to get something. And they call or shout for attention. Their babbling gets more complex. And we'll talk a little bit more about babbling in a, in a second, just because I think it's important to talk about. Um, and they're, you know, they're really starting to enjoy that music, the rhymes, patty cake, 11 months. They're kind of getting more in that catch and pass, ver like verbalization wise, they'll start going back and forth with you more. It won't just be kind of facial expressions or gestures. It'll be vocalizations back and forth. They'll start to be able to identify objects when you ask them. They can understand simple requests. Um, and at 12 months, we're looking at that. So those first words usually emerge. Um, if When they are babbling, it sounds like they're talking. And they'll do things, you know, nodding your head or shaking their head for um, for yes or no. So there's a lot that happens in those first 12 months. So babbling is um, a really important part of development. And what we see in kids who are um, typically developing is at four to six months, they're doing that mar marginal babbling. So they're just saying like simple constants and vowels, you know, like ma or something like that, ma. And at six to 10, you have canonical babbling. And there's a couple different types. There's reduplicated babbling. So that's when you'll start hearing them say like, ma, 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 like saying the same syllable over and over. And then they have the variegated babbling where they say combinations of different syllables. So that's when you hear like ma, ba, da, ga, things like that. And then that eight to 10 months is when the babbling starts to sound like they're trying to actually talk to you. And it kind of seems like they can go back and forth with a babbled conversation. So that's how, how babbling typically develops. So it's not, it's always interesting to talk about this because it's like, okay, babbling. Yeah. They kind of just like make sounds, but it's actually what children are learning is very structured and on kind of a very specific path of, of how they gain skills in that. So it's so important because this is when the child's experimenting with, you know, with sounds, with intonations, just with melody, and they're learning to control their speaking muscles, how they breathe, how they make sound. Um, the more they babble, adults tend to go back and forth with them more because they're making more sound. So they're really learning to, um, you know, listen to adults, hear how different adults sound. They're learning to imitate um, other sounds. And again, that reinforcement they get from babbling is, is really important for language building. So if a baby's not babbling by six to seven months, this would be a time where you'd want to talk to your doctor and um, seek out an evaluation with a speech language pathologist. But some ways that you can encourage babbling to see if, you know, you can, um, if your baby's not yet babbling or just to encourage babbling in general is really talking a lot when you're with your baby when you're holding your baby you can talk about what you're doing if they're in the stroller and you've got the dog walking too like you know we're taking the dog on the walk oh my gosh look at the dog smell those flowers like just lots of input is is really good along with those back and forth turns have fun with the sounds make silly sounds sing songs um look at look at the baby while you're talking to them, let them see your facial expressions. You can over-exaggerate some facial expressions when you make sounds. You can repeat them, you know, going back and forth like we talked about. So it's really something that you should definitely encourage and, you know, encourage them to, to babble as much as you can get them to babble because it's a really important learning period. And I think sometimes when we talk about language development, we don't talk enough about 
babbling, honestly, because um, this is this is a really important stage as well, along with with when they turn one year and they start using real words. So babbling is a really, um, really important part of development. So um, then when we come to one to two years is when we can really start kind of dividing it into that hearing and understanding, so that's receptive language, and talking, which is expressive language. So um, I think, I'm not sure, but I can probably send out um, a copy of these slides for this, because I'm going to, it's a lot of information right now, just because a lot of different things happen. So I'll just pick out a few things. But um, there's also, um, I mean, right now with with the internet, there's also really great stuff you can Google to um, to look at this, but I'll go over some of this now. It always feels like a lot just because so much happens between these these birth to five years. But for um, you know, hearing and understanding, you're looking at the child being able to to understand what their body parts are called, how to point to them, simple directions, simple questions, simple stories and songs. They can point to things when you when you um, call them out, like in a book, they're starting to use a lot of new words in one to two. They're using certain sounds like P, B, M, H, and W. Um, this is when they're naming pictures. They're asking really simple questions um, and they're putting two words together. So looking at more Apple, you know, no bed, mommy book. And we'll talk a little bit later about, um, you know, when, to be concerned if your child isn't doing certain things at a certain age. So we will, this right now we're kind of talking about what we would typically see. So really language building tips for this, for this age are just talk to them using a lot of different words and you don't have to really simplify your speech for them. You can use big words. They like hearing that too. And there's also studies that show that when you're talking to children, it's actually better to use full sentences rather than just being like, you know, car drive, which we call like telegraphic speech or like um, cat jump. It's actually better for their language development to hear like the cat is jumping or hear um, the, um, I forget another example, the car is driving or something. So, so use those full sentences with them, um, you know, talk to them as a child, but also don't, don't feel like you have to super simplify their, your speech, even when they're young. And then gesturing is good, um, you know, encouraging them to gesture. And again, um, you know, just explain what you're doing when your child's using longer sentences. So they can start using those one and two word expressions like, uh-oh, read book, more juice. Because they'll they'll talk kind of in that telegraphic chopped up speech. But it's good if, if you can use those longer sentences with them and ex um, expand on them. And then um, understanding when you get to, to two to three years, they're trying to really understand more. They can follow more complex directions. They learn words quicker when they're talking. They have a word for almost everything. They're starting to use those K, G, F, T, D, and N sounds. Um, they use words to say where things are. Um, people can understand them. This is also something to keep in mind. When a child is three, they really should be, I mean, like 80, 90% intelligible to people who don't know them. So they, um, if, if they're really, really hard to understand, that is even this early is a reason to seek out an evaluation with a speech language pathologist. So they also start the fun thing of asking why when they ask why for everything. And then we're looking at them putting those longer phrases together. So longer sentences. And um, for building language with them, just describing things is, is really great with them and using comparison words, asking them to name and point to their body parts and really encouraging those questions. And that's kind of a, a natural back and forth that you can do, you know. 
why is X, Y, Z? And you say, X, Y, Z is because of this. And they're like, oh, you know, and they say something else about it. And then you say something back. And even if it gets with these back and forth, it can go in any direction. It isn't that it has to be like delving into a certain topic. It's just that going back and forth wherever the conversation um, may take you with these little ones. And then when we're looking at three to four, um, they're understanding more words like words for colors and shapes and understanding words about family members. They're talking way more. Um, they're starting to understand rhyme and plural words and um, asking more questions still and putting those four words together. So at three to four years, um, you should hear them say something like, I go to school. You might hear things like, I go to school. They're still working out their grammatical system at this, this age, but um, they will start saying um, longer phrases. And they're able to talk about what has happened during the day. So this is, you know, you get about four years old and they should be able to tell you a little bit about what happened during their day. And then games are great for kids this age, like Simon says, pretend play, pretend play is, is really great for development. Um, and talking about just all kinds of different things, just, you know, filling them kind of with knowledge about, you know, seasons or animals or anything like that, encouraging them to interact with others. Um, and also kind of playing with sound too. Children this age love rhymes, love silly sounds, love going back and forth. And um, when they say words, if they say a word that's not clear, my suggestion would be to model it back to them usually. So if they say, um, I won't do an R because R is the trickier one. But if they say something like, you know, the tat, if they're supposed to say cat, then you can say back, oh yes, the cat. And as you get further down the line, as they get older, you might want to be like, oh, did you mean cat? And see if you can get them to repeat it. But if they're making sound mistakes, really starting with just kind of modeling it back to them can often help kids who are who don't struggle too much with their speech sounds to get over that, that hump. Four to five, this is a ton of stuff. So I definitely have to ask Joan if I can send this out. Um, this is when it just, the language explosion really, really is starting to happen. They're understanding way more things and they're saying way more things. The sounds that they can say are much clearer. They can answer more complicated questions. They can tell a story, which is really important um, for language development. Kind of notice if your child, um, can can tell you about their day or can tell you about what they did at grandma's house because that's something that they they should be developing by um, by five years of age they're going to be better in conversation like it'll be really more catch and pass will become so so easy because they want to go back and forth and talk all the time um, they can follow more complicated directions. They should be able to follow three-step directions. They should be able to follow directions that aren't um, related to each other. So even if you said something like, go get the ball and then put on your shoes, they should be able to do both those things, even if it isn't like, get your coat and zip it up, like things that go right together. They should understand that as well. They should also understand time better, kind of understanding that, okay, that was yesterday and this is going to be tomorrow. So um, they start to understand things like that as well. And the, you know, the letters, the numbers, um, all of that. And so this is when you can introduce concepts like first, next, and last. And we will talk, and I feel like somehow I'm taking way more time than I thought I would, but we will talk about um, reading books together and some tips for how to do that. So when you're, when you're reading the books, you can bring up concepts like what happened first, what happens next, what happens last. Ask them why questions to give them a chance to use their language to explain and, um, you know, let them express themselves, encourage them to talk. Um, and then for you, modeling clear speech, especially if your child's having trouble with some sounds, you can always model that back to them. Um, listening to music and songs, this is great for all the ages. 
And um, yeah, just telling stories and asking questions um, is really, really great for them. So with that, a really powerful tool through every single age from birth to five is shared book reading, which is why the Literacy Cooperative and Dolly Parton's Imagination Library is so awesome. Um, and shared book reading should be an active process. <clears throat> so this isn't just um, reading the words on the page while the child passively listens. This is, again, that idea of catch and pass, that idea of going back and forth with the child as you're reading the book to them. So reading strategies that you can use, um, one that the research has shown is called um, peer. So this is when you give a prompt to the child to say something about the text, then you listen to what they say, then you say it back to them, but expand on it a little bit, and then see if you can get them to repeat something to see if they kind of understood your expansion. So of course, you're not going to prompt the child to say something when they're only three months old, but you will be talking about what you see. You won't just be reading the book. You'll be kind of going off, off just what the words say on the page and kind of pointing to things. And if, you know, your young baby who doesn't talk yet points to something, you talk about that, notice what their, where their eyes are going in the book and talk about that. So never feel when you have a book in front of you that you have to like stick to what's on the page and just talk about that. It can go, it can go anywhere that your child is interested in. So talking about the prompts and how to get your child talking about the book, um, there's an acronym called CROWD. So these are different type of prompts that you can give your child to get them talking about the book. So there's completion prompts, which means um, you can fill in the blank, like give them things that fill in the blank. Oh, the dog's name was, and then Joey, and, you know, the the... Uncle Jim turns off the light, so letting them fill things in. There's recall prompts when you ask them, what just happened there? Or, um, you know, when you get to the end of the book, what happened to Timmy in that book? There's open-ended prompts. So just kind of asking them, what's happening? You know, where's the dog? Or um, what do you see going on here? So just those open-ended prompts. Ooh. So that's the CRO and then the W D W the W is on the WH prompts. So these are, you know, who's that? What color should dress? What does the animal eat? But I would say with these WH prompts, the tendency sometimes is to just like get stuck on these and just kind of ask the child a bunch of questions about what's going on. And that can be, um, overwhelming to a child sometimes when it kind of feels like a quiz when they're doing um, the book reading. And it can be difficult for kids who might struggle a little bit with language and are working on building their language skills to um, to fire too many WH questions on them. So I would say sprinkle those throughout, but don't get stuck on feeling like the only way you can get your child to talk about a book is saying, what's that, what's that, what's that? And then there's also distancing, distancing prompts, which is for kids who are a little older. So um, this could be things if it was a book about, you know, a birthday, like how, do, what did we do, you know, for your birthday? Like, how do we celebrate it? And if it's about a kid losing their shoes, what would you do if you lost your shoes? And you'd kind of be surprised how early kids can start giving you answers to, to things like that. So that's the different type of prompts you can give. Dialogic reading is a fancy word for reading together. And so those prompts are those questions about, you know, hmm, I wonder how he's feeling about that. Like all those prompts that we used. And then you're going to say something back. When the child says something, you don't just jump back to the book. You give some sort of response to them. You can expand on what they said. If, um, you know, you're like, what's, you know, what's the dog's name? And they're like, oh, the dog's name is, um, is Bobo. And you're like, yeah, Bobo is a brown dog. What color is Bobo? So anything just to go, to go back and forth like that. So I'm going to wrap up with just talking about some um, flags for referral to a speech, oops, for referral to a speech language pathologist. So these would be things for language that you'd want to look for. Um, just at four months, poor, on, 
poor eye contact or not being attentive to the speech of others, if they're not gesturing at all at six to eight months, if at 12 months they seem to have difficulty understanding because really that understanding develops before the speaking. So by 12 months, we should see, be able to recognize that they do seem to be understanding some things and just really simple directions that they're not getting that can be, you know, kind of a, a cause for, let me, you know, pay a little bit more attention and see if I'm seeing this across the board. If by 16 or 18 months they don't have words or they have a really limited vocabulary, that's another time to, to seek out a speech language pathologist. And then looking at 24 to 26, if they're not combining words or making short sentences, that's something they should be doing by that age. Um, for three years old, um, if they have like really a lot of grammatical errors going on, if they really just don't seem to be grasping the rules of language, that can be a reason. If they, like I said before, that ability to retell stories or talk about past events, that's a really important thing that develops between like three and five that um, you kind of want to just keep your eye on and see if you feel like that's developing typically. And um, once they get older, we're looking at things like attention, learning in school, but um, the almost easier part by that age is that they're in school and it's, you know, there's usually easier to get referred to a speech language pathologist than when they're younger and you're kind of not sure and it's just you trying to judge. And I would say if you ever have any concerns, you know, bring them to your pediatrician. And if your pediatrician is not concerned and wants to just wait and you don't, then it's completely with, you know, within your power to contact Bright Beginnings, which is the early intervention here, or reach out to us at Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center. And if you come to University Circle, we do a free evaluation. And then, you know, either way, either way, it's a good result because, you know, like, okay, they seem to be on track. Here's, and they'll always give you some tips of here's how you can keep growing their language, or you can find out that they might need some speech therapy. So I feel like it really, it never hurts to get an evaluation if you have concerns. So looking at speech sense, that talking, you know, no babbling is, um, is something that you would want to get evaluated for. Um, if they're not using any constant sounds, if they're just kind of using vowels, um, three years old, if their speech is unclear, same with four years old. Um, so once they get to about three and four, they should start being a little bit more understandable, especially for people that know them and not just to the parents. They should also be understandable to, um, to people outside of the parents. And um, fluency concerns, when children are very young, stuttering, repeating words, things like that can be part of typical development. But I will say if you're seeing things like the child not being able to get their word out, like if they say like, if they repeat words, if they repeat sounds, they might grow out of that when they're very little. Um, but when they can't get a word out at all, that's often a sign that that stuttering is going to persist. So that would be something to, um, to watch out for if that's happening very consistently. And then as they get a little older, if they seem to be embarrassed to talk or they have a lot of tension during their speech, that's also a reason to look into how to um, have their fluency or their, their stuttering looked at. And then also for voice, voice is another thing that SLPs treat. So if you have your child just is always hoarse, you know, or breathy or raspy, and it's not because they're just yelling all the time, um, then that's something you can ask your pediatrician about. And um, sometimes voice is something that um, that speech language pathologists can, can treat. So, oh my gosh, okay. So I talked for longer than I thought I was gonna talk, but there's just so much to say about this development. And I kind of feel like we should really break it down into like, okay, let's do a half hour on birth to one. Okay, let's do a half hour from one to two. So um, this is the contact information for our center. You can call us um, for Project Ella. You can email, um, I should have put her name, but Deja um, coordinates Project Ella. And if you want to email me, you can email me. But thank you very much um, for your time and attention today. And um, do remember, catch and pass is very, very important. Thank you so much. No problem. You had a lot to share and we, <laughs> we need to hear it. Um, and we'll have a little time for Q&A. And you know what? 
if we want to do this again and get more um, into detail on some of these issues, we can do it again. Uh, we had yeah. to do that with a session we did on toddlers with the pediatrician because there were so many questions in the Q and A. We actually then um, later recorded without an audience me asking the questions and doing uh, the Q and A. So we we uh -huh. can do we can um, we can revisit all of this um, and. Um, I'm sure people are going to be watching it again and watching it on YouTube. We are recording it, um, everyone, so um, you will be able to revisit this and we'll share that link. Um, before I go to the Q&A for others, I just wanted to, um, well, first, I was really happy to hear you reiterate messages that we and I send through the Literacy Cooperative and Imagination Library about the importance of reading, about the dialogic approach, peer and crowd. Um, and then also about that strong foundation in the early years and, and serve and return, catch and pass. I call it serve and return, you call it catch and pass. Um, but I just wanted to quickly talk about or ask you, because um, this is one thing I think people don't always think about when you are doing that catch and pass. I wanted to talk about background noise and um, the number of decibels um, that we want to, uh, how, what des um, how we don't want to exceed certain decibels for children, for young children's hearing. If we want to protect our children's hearing, for example, what do you recommend? Oh, okay, okay. Gosh, that is not, I wish I had my friend Bridget Whitford well, here, who's the audiologist. <laughs> well, we can always do another little blurb about that too. But if, I mean, if people have a lot of background noise while they're doing the catch and pass, say they have a TV on loud in the background yeah. or even soft or a radio and they're doing the catch and pass, Children can't filter out that background noise, correct? Yeah, children, children do have trickier, a trickier time filtering out competing signals. So I would say if when you're, you know, playing with your child on the floor, don't have the TV on in the background. Like, go ahead and have that turned off. Um, try to not have too much crazy distracting stuff going on around them. Um, decibel wise, I do not have a number for you, but I will agree with you, Joan, that the children do have trouble filtering. They just don't have that kind of executive function ability to do that. So if a distracting noise doesn't need to be happening, eliminate it. You know, I mean, sometimes you're gonna be in crazy environments and you can't help it. But yeah, I would say it's one of those things you don't like want the TV always going on in the background in your house. Like I know some people kind of turn it on when they come home and just let it run. And I would say just, you know, that helps the child focus on the communication if you don't have those competing um, signals going on. And and then just like to protect their hearing is even as they get older, for oh. all of us, we need to have the sound just not be too loud because it oh, can absolutely. damage hearing over time, right? Absolutely. So loud noises... Absolutely you know, you know, even a headset, I have to be careful to make sure my sound is down on my headset to protect yeah. my own hearing. Yeah. Okay, great. And then now let me go ahead and get to the Q&A. So um, some of these are specific and that's fine because I'm sure they often apply to other people's issues. My 21 month old has been tested by early intervention specialist. She scored just fine, but she is not talking there's a speech therapist assigned to her as well. We do talk a lot. We do talk to her a lot. She understands everything, but is not talking. So I think that's a statement, but I think the question is, what do you think? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> okay, yes. Yeah. So, um, okay, so 21 months, that's very early intervention. Um, okay, so it, it sounds like, although she scored just fine, that she is having sessions with the speech therapist. I'm not sure. It's hard to say how how many or how often. And I know that early intervention can be really overwhelmed um, with, with children. But I would say a great sign here is that she's understanding things. Like that is really, really positive. And I'm really glad to hear that. So that's great that, you know, her her listening, her receptive language seems um seems pretty good. But I'm wondering, I'm not sure what what strategies or anything the speech pathologists have given you, but I would um I would just suggest, I mean, what you're doing, talking to her a lot is good. Um and having just talking to her during certain routines and like kind of having similar words for the routines that you do and even planning out, like it sounds kind of funny to plan this, but if you think like, okay, when we do bath time here's like five words I'm always going to say. 
So I'll always bring up, you know, the, the duck that they play with in the bathroom or the soap or the washcloth. So even just kind of thinking of like, what are some key words for those routines that we have every day that I can really kind of, um, you know, that you, they're just words that you always say. And sometimes that can be, can be helpful. But I would say if you feel like, um, you're doing early intervention and maybe you're not getting as, as, as many services as you would like, like if you're not getting as many visits as you would like, um, you can always reach out to a clinic like Cleveland Hang and Speed Center and we can, you know, are often able to just see them more often. And we also, at Cleveland Hang and Speech, we have a really neat group for the little ones that's um, parent-toddler group. So it's toddlers and their parents together and toddlers can really serve, those little ones can serve as great models for each other. So I would say getting her around other kids too is also something that can be really important. But if you feel, if you're concerned that she's not talking, you feel like, you know, this the speech therapy you're doing now isn't, isn't quite getting her where you need to be. Never be scared to kind of, to seek out other services. Yes, I always recommend uh, seeking out more help if you if you need yes. it. Um, and and your school dis local school district too sometimes can be a resource, right? If there's yes, waiting yes, lists yes. elsewhere. When they, yeah, when they turn when they turn three, um, that is when you can contact your local school district okay. and they'll do an evaluation and they will get them set up for those those services starting in preschool. So yes, absolutely. When your child is is three and getting ready for that preschool age that's when school districts can can kick in with those with those services. And it's not unusual to have an SLP in school and an SLP outside of school if that's helpful to your child. You can you can do both. You don't have to do one or the other. Okay, great. And here's another question. Um, what strategies do you suggest if your loved one has a roadblock and is under a specialist care, such as a child who may need tubes due to fluid buildup? Oh, does that tubes they're talking about ear in the ear I think so think? yeah I think tubes um well I will say um so if they have I'm not sure what they exactly what they maybe roadblock just you know something kind of different about their development um I am if this is your child they're getting tubes I'm happy to hear that if it's if it's going to help with the ear infections because it is true that children who have really these recurrent ear infections, that's def definitely something that you want to kind of keep track of and um, discuss with your doctor if you should be concerned because what they're missing is some of those speech sounds and some of that language if they're having ear infections all the time. So getting tubes often helps with that. I know it doesn't stop ear infections or anything like that, but um, really even if there, there's something different about their hearing or the way they communicate really the kind of the same strategies still stand is that that like going back and forth and just you know as much exposure and, and talking about language as possible and i'm just going to note that in the chat um my colleague put a note we have a survey for people to fill out um when we're all done or when you're done with the presentation today if you have to leave please click on that and fill that out later we have one more, at least one more question. So um, this one says, I have a three and a half year old that's been diagnosed with a global cognitive delay and other speech language delay. Do you think that a structured preschool program is better than a home care provider? Um, I would say that we always encourage parents to enroll their children in preschool. Preschool is uh, is powerful. It, it absolutely is. Um, being with other children, be a, a quality preschool and head starts are really, you know, the vast majority of them are, are just really fantastic places as one option. And um, other preschools, you just want to make sure you, it's a preschool where the kids are getting, you know, great input that, it, that it's a good preschool. But if your child is able to enroll in a good preschool, we see kids who we're seeing at Cleveland Hang and Speech Center before they go to preschool, we encourage it, they go. And sometimes we see this like amazing growth just from being around those other kids, from being in that more structured environment. So I always suggest that that preschool is great, even, even for kids with something like a, a cognitive delay or speech and language, language um, challenges. It 
can be powerful for for them as well. It's really great for all kids. Preschool is is really important. Okay, great. And um, that same person asked this question: the school psychologist doesn't think that my toddler needs speech services, but I disagree. What options do I have? So what you can do in that situation is um, you can ask your school district to pay for an outside evaluation. So what would happen is you'd say, okay, I, you know, I see your results. I see what your recommendations are. I don't agree. I would like to get an outside evaluation. So we, um, we will, we do that for some kids. It doesn't, you know, happen all the time, but sometimes we'll get a call from a school district, like, okay, we want to set up an evaluation because this parent wants, it's essentially a second opinion on, on speech and language. So what happens then is you go to a center outside of the school, um, you get your child evaluated, and then that speech pathologist writes their report, and they can say also whether or not they recommend speech therapy, and then you then that goes back to the school and the school can talk to the clinic too. So that's kind of the first step if you're really not agreeing with that and you want them to get services in school and don't just want to pursue services outside of school, you can ask for, the school district has to pay for essentially a second opinion. So um, that's that's what I would I would pursue if um, if you're in that situation. Oops. Okay, I was trying to put myself back on video, but I don't know, <laughs> I did something wrong. So, um, well, I, I, we don't have any more questions in the uh, Q&A. 